because it's, uh, I know what you're thinking, great, another firefighter coming in trying to take our money. Um, <laughs> I've actually been uh, looking into this for close to a year. I've been bugging Chief Clausen about it for a long time, and he's kicked me out the door and said, hey, go get to uh, Spark Tank people and get this, get this win for us. So I'm, what is a tether drone? I, I didn't know about it up until about a year ago. I had no idea. It's actually just like a normal commercialized drone that has a camera on it with infrared capability that is connected to a high strength Tesla cable to a base station on the ground. So it comes with a command module, a tablet. All the drone does is go up and down to a max height of 150 feet. It offers almost all the applications that a traditional drone can use other than actually moving around. Uh, it doesn't require any licensing or training. I bring that up because with your traditional drones, you actually have to get your FAA Part 107 and have that reoccurring training. So like you hit on Colonel Jensen, the sustainability is going to be a lot easier for us with this compared to uh, the traditional drones because we don't have to have any reoccurring training. Uh, I'll get into the applicability. It's super easy to use, one-touch operation, and it's completely autonomous. So getting into the why, uh, it allows a snapshot of real-time conditions from uh, an overhead view. Uh, that information helps incident commanders on scene determine, hey, how bad is this incident? How big is it? What resources do we need? Is our uh, response uh, mitigation efforts being effective at the moment? Do we need to adjust what we're doing? Uh, one of the big key elements in this is it has a video streaming service that allows you to take exactly what the drone and the operator are seeing and display that imagery to uh, a tablet, a device, somewhere else. So extremely beneficial in the EOC. Uh, so how, how how nice would that be in the EOC if we had a hazmat spill or an ash event to be able to look and see exactly what's happening instead of getting an information channel from multiple avenues. You have a real-time snapshot. The EOC director, all of your emergency support functions have a real-time imagery of what exactly is happening on scene. Uh, it also has video recording operations, so we can use that for uh, after action assessments, um, providing information to the public. Uh, hit the applicability. Uh, I put fire, fire first, um, but we do have other applicable methods for like a street forces brother and some out of the box uses. First thing I put up there was reconnaissance for wildland. Does everyone remember what happened last May? Pretty big deal, mesquite heat. Uh, we had a lot of wildlands on base, and even now, we're doing uh, annual prescribed burns to take off all that vegetative fuel off the installation in a safe manner. So what this would do if we utilize this, this drone, we can put the drone up in the air. Your key members can look at and see, hey, where are our hot spots at? Where is it getting out of control? How is the wind affecting this, uh, this fire? You can use for hazmat incidents. Uh, I put hazmat up there because in the EOC we have that software system we all know and love called Chimera that I say uses uh, not really the most accurate plume modeling, I call it theoretical plume modeling. modeling. Uh, what that does is so you have a, a leak, a hazmat leak, it takes the wind, whatever uh, hazard is leaking in it, and it displays where that plume is going. That way your incident command team can decide, hey, we need to show up to the place, we need to evacuate. But we live in West Texas, the winds can be blowing 30 knots that direction one minute and then 30 knots that direction the next. So the applicability for that is, is a lot more substantial compared to theoretical software. Uh, some ARF incidents, flooding, fuel spills, and your active shooter hostile event responses. If we have one in this facility right now, it would be easy for the command team to set up that drone outside, see exactly where your exit points are at, where we need to stage your apparatus, where ambulances can come in. Uh, very useful tool. Uh, security Forces Brothers can use it as well. Uh, vehicle crash investigations, perpetrator search, and monitoring public events, just like the one we had last summer just outside the commissary with the concert. Uh, we can pop that, that drone up in the air and put one of the monitors in the VDOC and they have continual visualization of uh, that, that whole public event. Uh, somewhere out of the box uses, we have facility inspections, uh, com, com inspections, crime scene photography, and even road conditions, just like that winter storm we had last month. Uh, it helps our command team make decisions on a whole array of uh, clickable items. So here's a quick snapshot of what the drone looks like. You have your command module at the bottom connected to the base station, single button automation, you press it, completely autonomous flight. Uh, if you plug it into a power source, which uh, what we plan on doing is connecting it to one of our, our fire trucks. You have that key IP55 all weather rating, meaning that those Texas winds won't affect it, getting a, a stable imagery, and that 4G LTE video streaming service. 
this is what it would look like. You plug in your your, uh, your command box if you need to. One button automation, the drone comes up, you sync it to your command module real quick, and up you go and you have that elevated situational awareness in as little as 15 seconds. Another close up of this, kind of hard to see with the lighting. On the right side of this tablet, you have your uh, altitude adjustment, max height of 150 feet. You have uh, your real time imagery right here, and then in the corner, you can alternate if you want that infrared imagery as well. And you have the drone, uh, the two displays with your real time imagery and your infrared and your uh, command module. So getting to the pros and cons, the pros we have that prolonged flight time, it's, it's almost continuous if plugged into a power source. Uh, most of the commercial drones only run for 35, maybe 45 minutes max before you have to swap out batteries and bring it back to wherever you're at. A rapid deployment and it's completely autonomous without any training needed. The only con we can think of is just limited applicability. It only goes up and down, but still when you're on scene, typically it seems to move anywhere. You can set up in one spot and leave it in that spot as long as you need to. So judges, I'm asking you for $40,000. What that's gonna get us is that uh, this product is called the Photokite Sigma. You're gonna get that Photokite drone with two tablets. You're gonna come with the vehicle charging station so we can plug it into one of our fire trucks. You're gonna get the tabletop charging station so we can use that second display in the EOC, maybe in the chief's office, maybe at your house, wherever you want it. And you have to purchase the video streaming service for that as well. And if you want to bring up the video real quick, I can speak on a little bit of it. So the key in this is, is accountability and situational awareness. It's kind of tough to see in the sliding again, but uh, there's kind of three scenarios of where they're going. This scenario is more about the wildland feature. They have the apparatus mounted drone comes up, connected to that cable, no piloting necessary. You have your command team with the module. You can see all the firefighters down there with their lines. You've got the uh, infrared service on there so you can see the hot spots, see how effective that use is. Are, are they putting out the fire in the right spot? They need to readjust their tactics. Are they in a safe area that they need to back out? So another one for search and rescue. This is actually a, a scenario I've been on. You pull up to uh, a wreck in the middle of the night, a car accident. There's nobody inside the car. It's 2 a.m. You can't see anything. It's pitch black outside. So your first thought is, where's the driver? Where are all the passengers? If you can't see, now your firefighters can take care of that, uh, that fire. And now your command team can put that uh, drone in the air, use that infrared imagery to find the person laying out in the field. Obvious would be radio contact with them at all times. This last uh, view of overview of coordination is being an incident commander, you can't be everywhere at all times. Being a firefighter, sometimes you get tunnel vision on exactly what you're doing. You have fire in this structure, your troops are going in, they see fire, they see how, they say, hey, we're gonna go attack this right now. They're getting tunnel vision. They might not know the secondary and tertiary effects of what's happening. So that's where your firefighters are at, and all of a sudden, a secondary tertiary effect is happening somewhere else that they don't know what's going on when you having this overhead situation awareness uh, helps out determining your response efforts. Any for questions? Okay, good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Ford from the 7th Edition of the Squadron, America's Left and Strike Legislations. Yeah. All right, so to start uh -huh. off, I want to take a clap. All right. So to start off, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, tell two stories real quick. So the first one, um, about Uber. So anybody use Uber? Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. So before Uber, there was taxis, and they had all the power, right? So you had to go chase it down and say, taxi, and they keep all them going, you know. Um, you had to go to the taxi stands. When you got in, finally, the, the clicker started running. You didn't know how much money you were going to end up spending, right? So you're kind of long for the ride. So they had the power. And then along came Uber. And Uber said, you know what? You give the power back to the user. Press a button. Car comes to you. You know how much you're going to spend. Period. Dot. You're done, right? Pretty cool. Another disruptive innovation there is Amazon. You lose Amazon, of course. So in the Ford household, this last week, we had a, a situation. Um, go figure. We started running out of toilet paper. 
and uh, we got a little nervous, so we did an Amazon order, toilet paper came in, everything was, was good. Um, but let me ask you this, Chief Edmonds, how long would you wait for toilet paper? If you needed it right now, would you wait seven days? No. Okay, all right, you'd go somewhere and buy it, right? Pay a little more, get a taxi. Same day. Yep, exactly, bingo. Well, I mean, I would explain the head time. <laughs> but, 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 but let's say yes. your your toilet paper holder broke and you didn't have toilet paper anymore, all right? Weird. Yeah. But the weird thing is right now is the DOD does that. We're willing to wait seven days for toilet paper in the form of my caps, so critical aircraft parts, um, for them to come here to get our aircraft back in the air, okay? And we're willing to go in a taxi and pay more to get that toilet paper here faster. All right, so how do we how do we address that? How do we get to the point where we have Amazon and Uber-like things and the DOD? It starts right here in Dash Air Force Base. So set the stage a little more. Supply chains have been all the rage the last three years, right? We had a, a ship get stuck in the Suez Canal and it disrupted everything, like the butterfly effect, right? Um, right now, the, the Ukrainian war has disrupted ports and shipping, which translates to larger or higher uh, container costs. It translates to aircraft, truck movements, right? So this is ripple effect across the this, uh, supply chains is, is really impactful. Um, commercial industry is starting to kind of adjust to what they're seeing. So during COVID, um, I shopped on Amazon more than I should have. Um, so what we saw is an in, is an increase in commodity and, and online spending. Um, that's making the commercial industry adjust. So just recently, FedEx announced they're going to be pushing a lot of their their movements to uh, third party carriers to deal with what's called uh, deferred shipping. So you're willing to wait three days to get your your, your flip flops, right? That's that's not a big deal. Um, so that's a lot of movement, and they're going through hubs and spokes. So again, taking a little more time. But here, we need our toilet paper. We need it fast. We can't wait. All right. So. What can we do to get after that? Um, and why does it matter to us? So for those who don't know, um, for our air, aircraft parts um, sourcing, so where we get aircraft parts from, 50% uh, of those are called lateral supports. They come from Ellsworth or other bases that have B1 stuff. Get shipped down to here. 29% of that comes from DLA or parts support, mostly from, from Tinker, um, so not too far down the road. And then um, we wait an average of seven days for freight items. So that's large items, um, typically 150 pounds or, or more, or volumetrically large. I'm not talking small things. Um, we wait, we wait, we wait a while. That's because we have to go um, contract commercial trucks. Those trucks go to Dallas or Fort Worth and they get on either a, another air aircraft or they're transferred to another truck and they go to another spot and they do a hub and spoke thing because that's the way the commercial industry is best suited to, to move a lot of cargo. So, and, and it may come as a, as a surprise. We don't make up that much cargo for FedEx or UPS or Amazon, all right? So we don't do a lot of shipping. Um, just west of, of here, they'll do a million packages a day at the Amazon air, air facility. We don't get anywhere close to that, all right? But ours, I would argue, are pretty important because it's it's about national defense, it's about getting bombers. It's really important, all right? So what can we do? The answer is to diversify the delivery options, right? Let's get more Uber, let's get more other things that we can do to get our parts in and out and feed the fight. So um, before I tell the top left, if you can kind of see it, um, we'll get to that in a second, but just recently, right, we, we flushed the, the base, an awesome event. We saw the aircraft come back in today, pretty, pretty cool. Um, how would we get parts to those places that they went in an ACE scenario, right? We got to get off the X, bombs are incoming, planes got to go, we got to get parts to those planes so they can keep going, right? Maybe they're going to land in Holloman, maybe they go somewhere else weird. How do we do that? Do we rely on hubs and spokes? Do we rely on taxis to get our, our stuff there? We have another option. So um, the first option up there at the top left, that's part of Operation Warp Speed during the vaccine um, dis dispersal. They use Civil Air Patrol. Now, I'm not talking like high school students, right? I'm not talking that. These are experienced pilots flying um, aircraft-owned, or Air Force-owned aircraft, okay? So in the picture, kind of hard to see, but there are um, two doctors, and then about 100 pounds of vaccines, and then there were two pilots, so 600 pounds of cargo, um, able to go land in northern tier bases and drop off cargo, take off again. I'm not surprised you know that the Cost per flying hour of a civil air patrol aircraft is about 150 bucks, right? That's yeah, pretty affordable. Um, the bottom left here was a um, initiative out of Kirtland to try and do this and similar things. So starting with an N NGDS, that's a next generation delivery service. That's how we do it right right now. All right. So starting with that as the kind of baseline, and then what are the other options that we can we can do? So through US Transcom, we can do charter airlift. Cost a little bit more, but you can get an aircraft coming here. Um, you can do um, military airlifts, so drop a C-130 or C-17 in here, put a part on it, send it off, costs, costs a lot of money. Um, uh, city care program that's putting an airman with a thing and on a, on a plane to fly out of Abilene to go to Fort Worth to fly around. We do that a lot, all right? Um, driving, we do that, okay? 
Uh, so there are on there, but the, the goal of this whole project was to say, look at everything that's available, what do you need, when you need it there, pick one, press the button, plan comes to you. Cool. Um, so, can we do this? Yes, yes we can. Um, so, top left or top right there, the, this was news to me, so I heard the, I heard Civil Air Patrol and I thought, man, this is, you're, you're kidding, right? Like, but it really is a thing, okay? Um, Civil Air Patrol is actually an auxiliary unit to the Air Force. They fly Air, Air, Air Force-owned aircraft. Okay, right now it's mainly Cessnas. They do have some larger aircraft, and um, from their end of the spectrum, they would like to have, their current mission is, is search and rescue. Um, they'd like to have a diversified thing. Um, so and there's actually an AFI for this, and the AFI, what do say? Uh, this is to present a more cost-effective way for the Air Force to carry out its non-combat programs and missions. All right, so we can do this. The Air Force says we can do it. It's a good, good deal. So who else wants to see this, this done? AFWorks, Agility Prime, that's one of their um, industry-facing kind of challenges. They said, hey, we want electric vertical takeoff and landing. We want you to develop it, and the DOD is going to use it. What they need to see is an alternative way of shipping parts. So they have expressed interest in this project. And then um, when I was um, on the innovation team at uh, Tesseract, I um, had worked, started working this as the innovation kind of coach. Um, and then the guy that was doing it at, at Kirtland PCS, so it kind of went dead. So I'm picking it back up here. But um, I've already spoken to the NGDS program managers. We're, we're good to go there. Um, Headquarters Air Force Express Support. And most recently, um, Global Strike a A4M has Express Support. So what they would like to see is for us to do the uh, test, prove that we can do it, and then they're, they're willing to, to jump on. Okay, so the proposal. Judges are asking for fifteen hundred dollars, and to move over to the Civil Air Patrol, anything not used will be given back to us. Um, what we're going to do is establish a, as a support window. Um, so we'll do all the paperwork, and we'll say, "Hey, Civil Air Patrol, get get ready. We're going to call you in." And then we're going to look at about a two-week window to identify some some parts that need to go either to Ellsworth or come for El come to Ellsworth. Um, ideally, targeting like a three foot by three foot kind of piece of, of uh, cargo that we can, that would normally go pretty slow, and we're gonna get it there in under 10 hours, this is the goal there. Okay, with that, can't really read it, let's just put that on that side. With that, um, any questions? We either use live victims, which are, realistically, they're fine, there's nothing wrong with them, or some things you can't simulate, or we use mannequins, just like this. I'm sure you've gone through a CPR class, how many times have the lungs been broken, how many times did the mouth not open? <clears throat> you didn't get that feedback that you would have gotten in real life. One of the most common tools that we use in training is Rescue Randy. And I'm sure you've seen those all over base. Randy has served our country gracefully for years and years and years. But I'm pretty sure if you've seen one, he's missing some legs, arms. It's time for him to retire. Thank you for your service. So it's time to move on. It's time to modernize our training equipment. That's where the ALS uh, Simman mannequin comes into play. Let's take a look at some of the things they can do. So the biggest thing with the Sidman mannequin is you're getting that realistic feedback. So all of the interventions that our providers are giving, you're going to get feedback. So if you're not providing adequate compressions during CPR, the mannequin is going to tell you that. The Sidman will replace five different training tools. The life cycle from the, the, the uh, person that provided me with the quote is about five years, but that's in a, like a community college that uses this 
device every day. So it does a couple of different things, right? We can check vital signs, right? So me as the instructor, I'm creating a scenario for my students. If my student provides an incorrect uh, intervention, I can make my patient crash, right? Or if they're providing adequate um, interventions, right, their condition will improve. So that's the biggest thing is I want emergency responders to develop that muscle memory for severe incidents. You know, when you go through CPR, you're just learning the basics. 30 to 2, 100 beats per minute, provide ventilations with a back valve mask, right? So I just want to be clear, this is not a fire department pitch. This is an emergency responder pitch. We have, building, we have been building relationships with partners all over the base. So security forces, last year we developed our first active shooter response where we team up together. I've been training for the last year with the med group and command and control uh, units over there at the MCC. And EOD, here's a video, it's kind of hard to see, but I've done joint training with EODs a couple of times throughout the years. Had out there training exercise. I don't know if you can tell, but that's actually our buddy Randy right there missing mm -hmm. some legs. Yeah. You're still so on it? I mean, kind of. Right here. All right, you notice that spurting blood? Slow down, but he's still bleeding. Still bleeding? So I don't know if you can hear me. I'm providing exercise inject to this EOD operator who's putting on a tourniquet on a mannequin. He can't see what's happening. So I'm having to tell him, hey, you're throwing that tourniquet on, but it's not helping. What do you do next? All right, so he can't see that. So if we had another different tool, he would be able to see that. Okay. Now, recently, you know, the days of self paid buddy care are gone. We've moved on to TCCC. There's new threats. Active shooter incidents are on the rise. With this new deployment model, we're sending our warfighters downrange with limited resources and issues like COVID-19. We got hit hard during COVID. Without giving away, you know, uh, personal information, when COVID happened, I responded early last year to a patient suffering from COVID. The rest of my crew was new. They were trained, they were certified, but they didn't have that field experience to recognize what was happening to that patient. After I did my initial assessment, I realized it was serious. We got Metro Care and Rao, but I had to direct my crew members who were trained and certified but didn't have that field experience to treat this patient. Also, we were able to save her, pass her, on, pass her this uh, dependent onto Metro Care, but she had issues, long-term issues. And it is my professional opinion, if we did not act the way we did, then one of our members of Team Dice would have lost a spouse that day. So it's pretty significant. Now, through purchasing this mannequin, we're gonna hit, hit these lines of effort from Global Strike. We're gonna prepare our people, right? Our emergency responders from fire, security forces, EOD, to not only operate and treat our family, Team Dice here locally, but when they deploy downrange, in the, with that new deployment model. Engagement, we're doing our part. We're just asking that you help us. Mission, same thing. We want to be able to uh, support the mission here at Dias and also deploy locations. 